We're live? Okay, let's pray. Lord, thank you for the privilege we have of being in Hebrew class. I pray that you would help uh, you know, students in the class now and students who watch videos later to learn the material, uh, that we would also be uh, strengthened spiritually as we studied the book of Genesis, and that you would help with preparation for the final exam as well. And uh, thank you for giving us the Word of God, giving us your own thoughts in written form in the Bible. And I pray you'd help us learn those better, help the students prepare uh, for the test at the end of the semester. pray this for Jesus' sake. Amen. And help me to teach it effectively. Amen. Okay, so you have written up there some kafavs here. That is good. Let me take a look. Go ahead. You can go ahead and write. You, basically, you can assume that the kafav of everything would be something that would be good to be on a final exam. I mean, because, you know, this makes sense. So, and vocabulary stuff, too. Uh, so, let's see. Do you, you, don't, do you have to remember the... Alternative forms in the imperfect? There's two alternative forms for yiktivu. If you don't, I mean, you, you'll survive, but there's yiktivun and yiktovun with a noon, final noon. Does that ring a bell at all? He talked about it and then he didn't say anything about it ever again. And they're alternatives, so, okay. yeah. If you don't remember them, it's. But, they might be, you know, it might be extra credit. Did you write the participle up there? So, no. Oh, oh, good. Yeah. So write the participle up. And while you're doing that, I will look to see if everything else is right. Oh yeah, and then, then write the infinitive construct, the infinitive construct with the, with uh, like the first few suffixes. So my writing, thy writing, um, stuff like that. There's one form in the perfect that is incorrect. Yeah, your perfect is imperfect. So you have written an imperfect form, but you will write a perfect form. One imperfect is incorrect, too. Oh, no, wait, two. Three. There are three imperfects that are slightly erroneous. Um, you can just go up to the first and second person singulars. So did you write my writing? That would be his, or at least the suffix is uh, his. Yeah. Oh, we do, oh, I see what you're saying. Okay, <laughs> normally we do, but for the suffixes, it's different. So, yeah, like the perfect and perfect, they always put the third person first for those. But Lambda and, and I think other people too, they, they'll start, when, if you have suffixes, like if you're putting the suffixes on the word horse, start on the first person. Susi, suskaha, susi. So with the suffixes, go ahead, start with the first person. Yeah, I, you know, I never even thought about that, 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 but that, doing it that way. But hey, as long as you get them all right, it's fine. Where's the actual imper infinitive construct form? Just the, with the no suffixes. Oh, uh, yeah. <laughs> I don't think I did that one. 
Yeah, you better do that one. It's kathov. The inf uh, infinitive construct is kathov. It's shiwa kolam. <coughs> kolam? Shawacholam, <laughs> Kathov. Good. And then, of course, you have a dogish forte in the. Or a dogish. There's a dogish in the. Not a forte. Dot in the. Yeah. Kathov. Yeah. Okay, tov. Um, oh, did you ever get the participles up? Yeah, write the participles up. I think kothave is the masculine singular participle. So now we just need the masculine plural, feminine singular, feminine plural. Um, kotheveth is the feminine singular. Remember that? Kothev, kotheveth, kothevim, kotheboth. Well, not ko not kotheva, kotheveth. It has a, the tau at the end. Kotheveth. No, well, that's fine. But your your fem yeah your feminine singular yeah ko. That's kotheveth. Kotheveth, segol, segol. Yeah, kothave, kotheveth, and then kothavim, kothavo. Kothavim. Now you have kothavim, but there's a uh, reduction. So it's not kothavim, kothavo, it's kothavim, kothavo. That's shawaz. Is this too faint to show up on the camera? Can these forms are they visible? Oh, good. Both of you, both of us. Good. All right. Tov mode. Okay. Now tell me if you can find the one perfect form that is imperfect. Sometimes I've asked students that, and then. They find something else that I didn't see, so you know, then I find out there are two things actually. <laughs> I'll give you a hint only heavy suffixes have propretonic redu reductions. So. Shawas are only going to be on the first syllable of heavy suffix form. Okay. 
Heavy subject. Yeah, heavy subject. That's the 10 and the 10. Those are the heavy ones. They tend to do the same sort of things to the other stuff before. So it is Kuthav 10 and Kuthav 10, but they shall they wrote is not Kutha Vu. And I'm assuming that's a, a bait, even though it looks like a cough. It looks like Kutha Ka Ku, Kutha Ku, but Kothavu. Kothavu. Kothav, Kothava, Kothavta, Kothavta, Kothavti, Kothavu. Kothavtem, Kothavtem, Kothavnu. Kothavu. Where's Comet? That marker is not the greatest, is it? That's the better one? Okay. Kothavu. Now, that, is that a, um, a Hatef comet or a, I mean, a, yeah, they want the method. So Kothavu, good. All right, Tova Ud. Yes, good, thank you. Good, Kothav, Kothava, Kothav, Kothav, Kothavti, Kothavu, Kothavtem, 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 great. How about on the Yiktov? Give you a hint. It, the forms that have vocalic suffixes have a reduction earlier that did not happen. <laughs> that did not help, okay. Um, I'm trying to remember what lesson. It's actually something Lambden talks about. You could take, take a look in your book and see, and then figure out which one's there. I could just tell you, but I think you'll, if you catch them, you'll, it might stick in your memory bank a little better. And while you're doing that, I might be able to find what I wanted to quote you. Ah. Okay, look on page 99. You found them? Good. Tick to V. Look at the next form that has a suffixed vowel. And there's one more. And it's again with a suffix vowel. Good. And if you look on page 99, after he gives you the list of forms, notice he says, or note the reduction of the stem vowel from colon to schwa is regular before a suffixal element consisting of a vowel. So because they add the vowel at the end, it makes the holum go bada, go away. Pretonic reduction to a schwa. Oh, yeah, Mark Dane Brook. Well, good. I, I, at this point, actually, since as you memorize the forms and you go back and review, his explanation will actually sometimes, like first sometimes you might read his explanation and you're just learning it, it can kind of go in one ear and, I don't know, go out the other. But it actually, uh, the explanations will make sense. Just like now if you went back to the front part, remember that crazy front part? The front part will actually all make sense now. So, that's good. So, that would be, this you should definitely have down 
cold. Um, you should expect on the final exam that you're going, you know, being asked some of the regular ones, you know, also like, I don't know, uh, like a third hay or an Nothan or stuff like that. Um, those would also, you know, show up. But this is the one of the most important things that you would want to know. Um, and remember that the final exam only has questions from previous tests. So I think I did it that way. I'm pretty sure I did it that way. And so that's also uh, something to be aware of. Except, actually, before you take the final, I need to actually, uh, I think I have, yeah. So, but in terms of uh, stuff that's important, looking at the previous tests is going to be a helpful situation. Um, but yeah, I, I don't know if it, I got a camera, you want to take a picture of that, or just whatever, just but write that over in some of the other forms that, um, that you had to learn. It'd be good to, uh, good to be able to just have it down cold. I mean, right now the temperature outside makes it easy to have things cold. So, all right. Okay. Well, you want to go to Genesis? Sure, let's do it. Back to Genesis with Dr. Thomas Ross. Dr. Ross, what do you think is going on in Genesis 1 9? Well, blah, 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 blah. Okay, that's good. And we are on verse 9. Ooh, I'm going to plug my computer back in here. Okay, so we are here on day three. Remember day two, it didn't specifically state that it was good. And that wasn't because it wasn't good, but because things were not completed yet. So let me know when you have your I found it myself. You are ready. Okay, super. Okay. Well, let me get my physical Bible, too. Uh, where did I put it? There it is. Okay. All right. Go ahead and read the Hebrew of Genesis 1-9. Yomer, Elohim. Yikayu, Yikawu, Yikayu, Hamayim, Mitak, Mitakes, Mitakes, Hashamayim, El Machom, Echad, 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 what? Wasera Hei Hei Basha Where he came. Okay, Tov Malodin. What does that mean? It means And God said, let the waters be collected from under the heavens to one place, and let the dry land be seen, and it was so. Very good. Can you say that a little bit more slowly? And God said, let the waters be collected from under the heavens to one place, and let the dry land be seen, and it was so. Okay. 
Tov. Tov Ma'od. It's not a bad translation there. I gave you the Yifkawu. I told you the parsing for it. Um, what does that trilateral root mean? Um, for Kawa. Let be collected. Well, remember, if we're asking for the trilateral root, that would be the base for Nif vowels are often oh. passive. Uh, be collected. Collect. So collect. Okay. Collect, gather. Um, actually, in B, yeah, BDB has collect as the right after the verb, and then nif vowel says be collected. So, so good, that's fine. Can let the water be collected together. Do you have it on your computer, BDB? Yeah. Oh. I have everything on my computer. <laughs> Except the patristic Greek lexicon of lamp, because that isn't available. I would like to get that. I would like to have that on my computer, but I don't, because it's not available yet. What is that? It's the standard patristic Greek lexicon. So I only have a physical. I only have a physical copy of it. Do you have a theological dictionary of the Old Testament? Oh, another one thing I don't have too. I don't have the uh, the um, multi like Old Testament the Kittle because mm -hmm. that's so yeah, rare. Yeah, that's what I want. Yeah, I don't have that. I got the Hebrew one, but I don't know. Yeah, yeah, that one's it's out of print. And one apparently, one log, I asked logs about the people who own it are kind of ick. Like, like the copyright, they're kind of like not wanting to let it go or something. So I don't know. But I would like to have that, yeah. yeah. But oh well. Of course, if the Lord doesn't come back and he waits 75 years from when it's published, then it would just be public domain. So anyway. When would that be? I don't know. I don't know what year that would be. Hopefully after the rapture, in the millennium. Um, Can it be recopyrighted? It might be, yeah. But not in the millennium. I think in the millennium, it would probably be in public domain. Yeah. <laughs> So, <laughs> all right, let's see. Um, Wayahi, what is Wayahi? Wayahi Cain. Uh, and it was, and Cain is so. Sure, and we, what's the parsing oh, for Yahi? Okay, um, there's a while converse um, of Haya, call and perfect, uh, 3MS, apocopated, is that how you say it? Yes, good, apocopated. Third hey. Good. Hey, did I tell you that? I don't know. You got it right, so that's good. Amen. Okay, um, tell me about Yab Hayabasha. So what? Where are you? Oh, this is the next one. It oh, says okay. Genesis one I pars Hayabasha. Okay. And so you can uh, Yeah, parse it. Okay, it was um, a noun, feminine noun. Is that okay. right? Sure. Yeah. It's, is it uh, singular? Is it plural? Is it dual? It's singular. Right. So it's feminine, singular, and it's not construct. So it's a feminine, singular, absolute noun. And what is the lexical form? It would be. Yod. You can just say it. Bath. Oh. Right. Um, yavasha. Yeah, yavasha. So, yeah, if, if I asked you, like, parsing of a noun, that's what it would be. It would be, like, fem the number, the person, <coughs> absolute construct, you know, noun, adjective, particle, whatever, and then the lexical form. So, it's a feminine singer, absolute noun from yavasha, and it means? Um, uh, dry land, of dry land, opposite okay. to sea. Okay, and there's obviously also there's also an article on Hayabasha. So if yeah. I asked you the part of the whole thing, so you, you'd say this is a feminine center absolute noun from Yabasha. It means dry land, and it has the, the article. Now it's related to the verb. What verb was above it in BDB? Do you happen to remember? I could look it up because I have the page number. Okay, yeah, look it up in BDB. 
that is that that is a nice feature in DDD. How everything, all the related words are underneath the, the trilateral root. It's page 386. The verb is yabesh. Good. And what does that mean? Um, dry or dried. Good. Die, dry, dried up, withered. Good. Tov mode. Okay. So um, that was good. Now the next question here is after you translate the verse parts, we'll look at the translation of the KJV. How did the KJV translate it? Oh, I don't have my, I don't have it. Oh, I got it on my phone. You only have your NASV? No? Oh. <laughs> no NASV? Okay. NASV is definitely not as good as the King James. Uh, verse 9. Oh. No, wait. Okay. It didn't change, it's still in First Corinthians. There you go, okay. You ever hear of the IWDV? No. It's what happens when you know a little bit of language is enough to be dangerous, and it's the I want it to be version. So you have your, your position, you want it to be, and you just say it, and you have something in Hebrew that actually doesn't necessarily support it, but you can, you know, you can do that. <laughs> it's a very commonly used version. So. It says, and God said, let the waters under the heaven be gathered together onto one place, and let the dry land appear, and it was so. Okay, dry land. Um, tell me, dry land would obviously be the King James translation for Yabasha, but what do you notice about the word land? It was italic. Yeah, it's italicized. Um, <clears throat> so what does that tell you about the KJV's use of italic? I thought it was unnecessary in that verse. Hmm, okay. Um, you could, Yabasha, because it's related to Yavesh, which means dry, dried up, or withered, you could hyper literally render it as the dry. Let the dry appear. Okay. Um, in the Bible, it always is dry land. Mm -hmm. So, you know, that's a perfectly legitimate translation. Um, but what I actually w wanted to point out there is um, you actually, when the King James has italics, they, they usually have a good syntax, there tends to be a good syntactical or some other good reason for it. So it's not like you could just take it out and you, it isn't just like, sometimes not, not people get, well, since italics the word isn't representing a specific Hebrew word or whatever, if we just take it out or whatever, it's, it's exactly the same. There's actually usually, it tends to be a good reason for it to be there. Like here, dry land actually is a better, it's better to say dry land than just say let the dry appear. Okay? Even though there isn't a specific separate word, aretz, and they're so concerned about being literal here that since yabasha is related to yabash, which means dry or dry, they just say dry and they put land in italics. Um, so it actually, I think, uh, gives an illustration of how uh, the King James, even when it has italicized words, there is a good, tends to be a good reason for them, for them sticking them in there. So, um, like if you look at the other instances, you didn't have to do this for class, but if you look at the other instances with uh, Yavasha in the, the um, King James, you have it, Genesis 1, 9, and 10, dry land, and I italicized land. In Exodus 4, 9, it's dry land again, with land italicized. Um, Exodus 14, 16, the Israel will go on dry ground, and I italicize ground when they're going through the Red Sea. Same thing in Exodus 14, 22. 14, 29, dry land, land italicized. 15, 19, dry land, land italicized. Uh, Joshua 4, 22, they actually don't italicize land, which is kind of interesting. Um, and then Isaiah 44, 3, dry ground, ground isn't italicized. Then dry land, italicized. And Jonah, um, let's see. Anyway, so it's it, it's land every time. If you if you do a word study, it's it's actually I you know land. Actually, had a couple other verses that you didn't mention. Nehemiah nine eleven. Yeah, yeah. Nehemiah nine eleven, Psalm sixty six okay. six, Jonah one thirteen two ten. One did you have one Jonah one nine? I did. Okay. Dry land. 
easy one, one a few clicks of the cording. But anyway, so the KGM, King James italics are not arbitrary additions that are better, better left out. You should assume that there's a good reason for them if you see them. That was what I wanted to get across your honor. They are to the point that you could even justify maybe even not italicizing the word at all. Just leaving it normal. Okay, do um, you have any questions about verse 9? Anything else you want to say on verse 9? Uh, no, I don't believe so. No? Okay, great. Um, let's go to verse 10 then. You want me to read the translation? I'd like you to read it in Hebrew and then oh. read the translation. And note where your voice goes up, where the accent marks are, unless it's post-positive, pre-positive. OK. If, uh, if possible. I know that you know, you're not speaking Hebrew all the time, so it's going to be a little bit of a challenge here. Where yikra? See, like there, it's where yikra. See how the ah. accent is over the ra? Mm -hmm. So it's not where yikra, it's where yikra. <coughs> where yikra, like that. Where yikra. Ra. Elohim. Le-ye-ba-sha, Eretz, Wul-meek, Wul-meek, where is that? Wul-meek-way, 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 Hameyim, Kara, Yameyi, Yameyi, yeah, meme. Where yeah, where yeah. Elohim. Key talk. Mm -hmm. And by the way, like the the um, Jews today, like if you went to a synagogue with reading this, the different accents have different pitches, so it's like musically they say it, um, but we're not you know, doing that in class right here. But that's actually they they have a different like pitch that goes up and down for the way they say them. So. Anyway, okay, let's get the translation. <clears throat> and God called the dry land earth, and to the collection of the waters he called seas, and God saw that it was good. What words are translated it was at the end? What Hebrew word? Ketov. So where's the verb was? Um, it is in brackets. Good. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, it should be in brackets. You know, no, I think that it was good is a good translation, but brackets or italicizing it was is, is the way to go. So. All right. What is the parsing of wa yikra? Didn't we just do that one? Did we? It wasn't the end of the verse. Was it in the last verse too? It might be. God is calling a lot of things. No, it was wa yomer. Oh, okay. Now we have wa yikra. Um, we're in verse ten, right? Mm -hmm. It would be a well conversive. Uh, call and perfect, cal, cal and perfect, 3MS. Like the trilateral root, and what does it mean? Um, kara, which means uh, to call. Good. So cal, well conversive, um, three ms imperfect. Um, kara to call. Elohim, so should I say to call or he call? Called. Typically, the lexical form is the three ms form perfect, 
Mm -hmm. But typically, people just say it's to call, even though obviously we're not putting the infinitive construct in there. Mm -hmm. So as long as you rec know that it's the 3MS form, if you want to say to call, that's fine. But just don't think that's actually you know, an, an infinitive construct. Okay. So we call the dry land RS. Um, what is a uh, mikwe? Ula mikwe. What is that? It was oh, and, and to the collection of it. It was a um, well consec sec, um, uh, prefix with the la. Yeah, good. It's just a wow. It's only, you only have wow conversive or consecutives on verbs. So this is not somehow flipping the noun around or something. It's just a wow um, followed by lamed two, and then um, mikwe. And what is the parson from mikwe? It is a masculine. Plural? Is it plural? That's what I have written it's on my paper. Singular. Yeah, I'm looking at it. It looks singular, but I don't know why I have it at plural on my paper. Okay. Masculine singular? Yep. Is it a noun? Uh, noun, okay. What's the lexical form? Um, mikwe. It's actually mikwe. Wa. With a segol. Here it has a tsere because it's in construct to hamayan. So it's a masculine singular construct noun, uh, lexical form, mikwe. And it means, what does it mean? Um, it means collection or collected. Yeah, gab, collection, reservoir, pool. Um, so, okay, the mikwe, I'm going to say this something about that a little bit later. The mikwe, hamayan, and kara, what's kara there? And kara, yeah, I mean. Kara is a um, call perfect 3 ms um, he called. And how about uh, Wayar? Wayar Wayar is um, he saw, which would be a while conversive, uh, kel imperfect 3ms of Ra'a. Good. Which means to see. To see Tov. Tov Mo'od. Okay. Um, the word sees is plural, um, and there could be a play on words here with mayim, waters, and yamin, seas. That's um, possible. So I just wanted to point that out. Um, there's also a possible play on words between makom, place, in verse 9, and mikweh, um, reservoir or pool in verse 10. Um, if you looked in the Kohler Barometer lexicon of Mikwe, it says in modern Hebrew, water reservoir, um, a, a collecting place with, with water, mayim, and, and those texts. The other places where that word is found, um, it's with water too, gathering together the waters here in, in Genesis 1.10. Exodus 7.19, it's the pools of water. In Leviticus 11.36, it says a fountain or pit wherein there's plenty of water in the King James, but the King James margin says on that Hebrew, a gathering together of waters. So there could very well um, also be a play on words between a place. So the place becomes a pool, um, a place where the waters gather together. So just uh, interesting there. Now, he, God here, he names and calls the dry land and seas, so he's sovereign over them. Uh, their sea isn't, there isn't some like goddess of the seas that's fighting him, like, and then he cuts up the, uh, the body of the goddess and makes it into something, you know. Um, so he's sovereign over them. Um, and the earth produces and sustains life. It um, provides space for the land creatures and the people. Um, and the land is ordered for God's human life and security. 
Verse 10 has a structure just like verse 5, if you compare them two. They both have the verbal pattern of yikra followed by kara. So kara with a wow conversive and then kara perfect. And they both have a chiastic structure of ABC, BAC. Verb, indirect, object, object, followed by indirect, object, verb, object. So their structure is the same, verse 10 and 5. So uh, we're now advancing from the category of um, time, he made day. Now we're getting some space here, so we're getting some land here. And this is the last time in the creation account where God names anything. So he's going to continue to create, but then he doesn't name. The, the responsibility for naming is actually in chapter 2 and 3 delegated to man. Man names the animals, he names his wife, um, stuff like that. So, And then in 1-1 one, one we had heavens and earth. Now we're kind of shifting to earth on day 2, and now we're going to be moving away from the waters and seas and the dry land and earth here in 9 and 10 to the land and earth alone in verses 11 and 12. So we're moving towards um, closer to where mankind is here. Um, and the waters are mentioned before the dry land in verse 9, but the dry land is named first in verse 10 because, again, it's focusing on earth where uh, man is going to be. So there's this chain, the development and the focus here. Okay, do you have anything else you want to say on verse 10? Did he name Adam? I'm trying to remember, did he name... Um, yeah, definitely on verse 10, but... No, I don't think it specifically says that he named him. Yeah, I don't see it here. Yeah, it's a good question. I mean, obviously, it says God the Father is one of who, from whom the whole heaven and earth is named in Ephesians, but... In, in the Genesis context, the last time God specifically said to name anybody is here. And then man is doing it in 2.19 and 2.20, 2.23, 3.20, 4.17, 25.26, 5.3, 5, and 29. So man does a lot of naming after this um, as the delegated head over the creation. Okay, let's translate verse 11. And after verse 11, we'll take a break here. Uh, verse 11. And God said, let the earth bring forth grass. <coughs> oh, wait, wait. We need Hebrew here. Oh, sorry. What, are, what is going on here? <laughs> we, we yomer Elohim uh, Tad te, te, uh, she Tad she Tad she Ha Aretz Desha Desh Desha Desha Asev Mezria Zere Eights Pari Um Osh Osh Ose, Ose, Ose mm -hmm. Pare, Pari, Lamino, Asher, Zer, O, Zero, Bo, El, El, Ha, Aretz, Where, Ya, He, Cain. Okay. That was too bad. Okay, let's hear it in. Appeared in, in English. And God said, Let the earth bring forth grass, herb to produce seed, fruit trees yielding fruit towards his kind, that of his seed in him upon the earth, and it was so. All right. A little bit of turbulence there, I think. I was going to say it was a little bit bumpy, but turbulence is more dramatic to say it that way. <laughs> um, the in him after seed, what is the him? Who is him? The him would be the, wait, let me find it. Asher, Zero, Vo, Al, The him would be the, the, the fruit. Wait, fruit trees yielding fruit towards his kind. 
that of his seed in him. Okay, the fruit has a seed in him. Um, the, the, okay, so let's go back here a little bit. Um, okay, I'm going to come back. Let me just do a little bit of parsing here, then we'll, we'll go back to that. Right, Yomer, I think we've seen that a bunch of times already, right, in the beginning? Yep. Yeah, so it's a cal, all consecutive, free MS, Omer, to say. Tad Shea, I think I gave you, but the lexical form is Desha, which means what? Or Dasha, um, rather. Dasha caused to sprout or shoot forth. BDB 206. Okay. Sprout, shoot forth. Um, BDB didn't say cause the sprout. It says that on the hifiel in BDB. Okay. So yeah. the hifiel, so when I ask you the lexical form, go ahead and give me the cal. Okay. So the cal is sprout, shoot, grow green, and the hifiel is often causative. And so here it's a hifiel, hifiel jussive, cause the sprout or shoot forth. Um, but la the BDB just says sprout, shoot, grow green. So, so God uh, shoot or bring forth the earth, desha. And what is desha? Grass. Okay, grass. Shit. Mass single absolute noun from desha. Um, Masria. What is Masria? It is from the zare, which is the the seed. To seed. To seed. Um, no, it's a. Uh, yeah, it's a verb to seed. It is. It's, it's to the sow so seed. We don't really have so a. Seed. Do we have an English verb to seed? Produce seed. Well, it, it's. It's not. Um, Produce like making the seed. It's sowing the seed, like okay. in the. Oh, I'm on. I'm on. I'm core bomb critter. The quote I took from page 282 said, produce seed of herb um, or woman bear child. Okay, go, okay, go, to, that, go to that page in BDB. Okay. Um, okay. So it starts on 281. Okay, notice you have the lexical form at the top, zara, right? Mm -hmm. This is verb, so, scatter, seed. So if you want like a definition to put for the basic meaning, typically it gives you a nice, simple one right after the word. So that would be like the basic sense. Now beneath there, you can see there's a lot of subcategories. Like you have one, literally, so, a, absolute, so, seed, doing sowing with plowing and so on. And then it, well, I went down here. Then it gives you beat with an accusative of land, of seed you're sowing. Um, you can sow things that destroy city. Then two of shrub and tree producing seed, yielding seed. And there you actually have, it says Genesis 129 is an example of that. Um, then it says of Jehovah's sowing or planting Israel in the land, fructifying. So there's a lot of subcategories. Um, and sometimes it, you'll, now, the lexicon isn't infallible, but sometimes they'll even put the verse you're looking at in one of the subcategories, and that can be helpful, even though, of course, he could be wrong which category it is, but, but very often he, he's correct. Um, and then he gives you the nifal and puel and hippiel and so on. So um, when we're classifying what it is in the passage, looking at all the sub-definitions is a very good idea. But for just parsing purposes, you're pretty safe just putting what it says right, away, right after the verb. So, so, scatter seed. Um, okay, so, so the asev, and what is, an, what is asev? Asev masria zera. Um, asev, I think that's herbs, isn't it? Yeah, grass or yeah. herbs. It's not, 
restrict it to what, like today we think of herbs like stuff you put on salad to make it taste good, something like that. Herbs is just herbage. Could be weeds, plants. Um, it's the general plants that get eaten here by people, so and animals. So herb, herbage, grass is all fine. So yeah, there's nothing wrong with herb, but just as long as you recognize we're not restricting it to, uh, um, you know, just like little tiny herbs. Would it be different from grass in the sense of consumability for, I guess, humans could eat grass? The, the word could be used. The, the ASEV could, yeah, I, I see what you're saying there. It, um, if you translate it as grass, you might think it would not include food for human consumption. You could say herbage, but herb is fine. But you just want to make sure we're not mm -hmm. restricting it because the plants eat well, this stuff. It's the not. plants eat that, like the cows and so on mm -hmm. eat this. So vegetation. vegetation, vegetation. Yeah, you could say vegetation. Yeah, it's um, there. You kind of get the sense it's like a field or something. This is you know sprouting things. So anyway, so so the grass um, sowing seed or producing seed. Here, because it's hip field, there's that causative, so causing to sow seed. Uh, grass causing to sow seed. And then the peri eights. One of those were, there's a, um, eights. Tell me about eights. Eights, peri, osa, oh, Eights is trees. Um, well, tree. Tree. Uh, okay, but good. It's a noun, masculine, uh, but obviously in the correct co collective sense. Yeah. <coughs> and, um, yeah, so it is singular, masculine singular. It's actually construct to the pari. So the tree of yeah. fruit, which means fruit tree. You translate fruit tree, it's fine. So the tree of fruit, now we have osa. And what is osa? Osa is yielding. So uh, give me the parsing for it. Yield. Um, it's a um, participle. Good. Mm -hmm. Masculine. No, it's feminine. Right. You could s you see the hay at the end. So you think, oh, maybe this is feminine. But remember, kothav, kothaveth, kothavim, kothaboth. Mm. Okay. So. The reason it has the hey at the end isn't because it's feminine, because the participle has an F at the end, normally, at least anyway. Um, but what's the lexical root for this word? Um, osa. Yeah, asa. asa. So it has the hey because it's a third hey verb, lexical form. So asa is what the form is. It's a participle. Is it a cal participle, a nifal participle, a hifial participle, a hafal? Fifth by L. Kale. It's a cow, because otherwise I would have told you what it was. <laughs> so it's a cow participle. Um, and you said, is it masculine, singular, um, feminine? It would be singular. So it's singular. And is it masculine or feminine? Masculine. masculine. So it's a cow participle, it's masculine, singular, it's absolute, it's not construct. And asa, what does that mean? Yield or yielding. Here, yielding is fine as a translation, but if you look under, the, the fundamental idea of asa is to do or make. Like, if you memorize asa, memorize it as do or make. I don't even know if, let's see. Yeah, we had that in there. Yeah, I would think it's a very common verb. So like asa and BDB, right after it, it says do make. So here, the tree of fruit making seed Make, the tree of fruit making fruit after its kind is, you know, a fruit tree yielding. So if you want to translate it as yielding, fine. But it's the, if you're going to be hyperliteral, it'll be the tree of fruit making fruit um, to its kind. Actually, that's what I have in my notes is make, and then under number two is produce yield of grain yielding. BDB oh, okay. Okay. Yeah, that's fine. Yeah. Sometimes BDB can be nice. It actually gives you some translation helps. That's one nice thing about the detailed lexicon. 
Okay, so let me know to its min is the word kind, mean, lexical form, maim, hirek, yod, noon. Um, the O at the end is the third masculine singular suffix. And you have asher, that or which, zero is the seed with the suffix three ms again, and it's concert. So the seed of it. Now the bow, that was what we were talking about before. They were kind of wondering what the, of, of him. Mm -hmm. um, it, it's, it's the seed. So that, that clause, zero, vo, would be um, with asher. Asher is like here whose, or that. Zero, vo, would be its seed is in it. So the seed is inside the fruit. So the fruit after its kind, whose seed is in itself, whose seed is in it. So it is a 3MS suffix, so you know, him, I, I know what you're doing, but since the antecedent word, the zara, or zara rather, is not a human, you're fine saying it. Okay, so you can say, so its seed is in it, um, instead of who, his seed is in him. Upon the earth, Al Haaretz, right? He came in it. So, so what if you're dealing with like I could see with fruit seeds? What about animals? Like, if you have a female or masculine animal identified behemoth. I mean, it's it. it you can okay. Would you make there's a feminine and singular. Obviously, in Hebrew, there's words that are feminine, words that are masculine, and so on. Mm -hmm. And basically, you don't need to translate every single word that's mas like, like masculine antecedent with a masculine pronoun, in, in because you want to recognize that the pronoun in Hebrew is masculine, but you can translate it with the appropriate English pronoun that matches the word in English. So with animals, basically, you can do what would make sense, what would be reasonable in English. So. If it's your dog, Schnuckums, you can maybe, you know, him. But if it's the cow that's out in the field, you want to call it it, that's fine. Unless it's, you know, Bessie. <laughs> so, so, or lunch, I don't know. Anyway, um, well, no, not in Genesis 1. Who would be lunch in Genesis 1? <laughs> so, yeah, okay, any, uh, that was a more challenging, any questions on the translation of Genesis 1.11 there? I don't think so. Okay. So now we have the interesting text critical notes that were a little bit challenging too. With those notes, since he doesn't give you the vowels, I'm not going to ask you to try to read it. Though actually, if you use the Ginsburg thing, you could actually read it because he does give you the, the um, form for the vowels there. But what do those notes mean? It says, in many books. Hey, did we translate the note on verse 10? Um, I, I think we didn't. I think we skipped it. Let's go back and uh, translate the Oh, yeah, I forgot to ask you that. So go back for a second. So in, ver in Genesis 1.10, translate the Masoretic note on Genesis 1.10. Um, Where and he saw... Um, by Jericho, in Jericho, mm -hmm. and uh, meth, I don't know what it was, there's no vowels, but it means provide a method. Yeah, method. basically the note is saying that, in co that the word, and notice there, it says verse 10 at the bottom. In verse 10, what word has a little circle over it? What word is the note referring to? <coughs> Where year? Yeah, well, yeah. Good. Yeah, yeah. So basically, the notice now in that word in the text, does the wayer have a method? Nope. No method. So the note is telling you that in the Masoretic Codex Jericho, which we no longer have, and we no longer are aware of its presence, it might be lost as far as we know. In that codex, it had a method. So, one thing we can learn from that is that these ancient Masoretic codices had vowels uh, whenever they were made. They were not solely consonantal. And there are other notes like that that talk about ancient codices that have vowels. So that is interesting. 
So not the most exegetically significant note there, but it does tell you that there was this Codex Jericho that had a method in it. Okay, great. Let's do the ones on verse 11. How old are these notes that they have notes on Hard text to that say. don't exist anymore? The Masoretic notes don't date themselves. They don't say, I was written down in you know, year 694 by Yoshua ben Ammoni or whatever. So we don't know for sure how old they are. But a note like that is probably pretty old. Because, I mean, the, the codex is gone. We don't know where this codex is. And it was some significant enough ancient codex that they put this note in about it. So if you believe that the vowels were invented by the Masoretes late, you would have to say this note is later than you might otherwise. Because obviously they couldn't have written a note like that because there weren't vowels yet. You know what I mean? So then you would kind of shift the note back later than you might otherwise. Okay. The Jews thought the first Masoretes were Ezra and so on. So they say there were Masoretes all the way back then versus only posts, New Testament, late, 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 late. So, um, and we have essays for second semester to, to read the history of this whole question. Now, the ones on verse 11, those were um, put in by Ginsburg. So the Masoretes didn't put in what these two notes are in verse 11. How do you know the difference um, between Ginsburg If it's a lost, <coughs> the content of the note, yeah, he doesn't actually just tell you, which is, there, which is kind of too bad. There is actually, he has a whole, there's a whole book like an introduction to this edition of the Hebrew Bible, which I have online, even though it's from a, it's not a like perfect preservation perspective, so you have to be kind of careful, but. It talks about all kinds of stuff with this edition in there. But the content of the note will make it very clear. Like if there's a note about an ancient lost Masoretic Codex that doesn't exist, Ginsburg didn't have it. Okay. If the note says, the Samaritic Pentateuch says this, the LXX says this, the Syriac says this, and the Targum Jonathan says this, that would be something that Ginsburg was compiling and put it in. Okay, so verse 11, what are these uh, interesting notes in the bottom side? Okay. Um, in many books, manuscripts, and other copies, the text, uh, Asher, which would be... Um, Where did the Asher come from? I don't know. My paper, <laughs> I wrote it. <laughs> yeah, there's no Asher in there. This is Desha. It's that first, you write, the first note, you're doing well. Barov Sifarim Kethuviod. In most codices written by hand. Kethuviod. Oh, I might have been from the printout thing. I don't know. Um, anyways, in many books, manuscripts, and other copies, the text. Yeah. It's telling you something about the word desha. Desha. Oh, maybe that's why I wrote it, because I didn't know. Desha. Wait, what did you say? No, you tell me. What's the, what, what's, what's the end of this note here saying? Desha. <laughs> no, what's after the desha? Oh. What's that? Um, there's a bath, there's a zion, there's two lines, and there's a kof. It's a bath? Yeah, after the word desha in the note. Some abbreviated word. I don't know. I'm not making sense of my notes here. This was a challenging note. Um, OK. If you looked the words up, the first one is, in, they all are in the abbreviation section in your Ginsburg. So the first one is barov. Ba is just in. Rov is many or most. The next word, sefarim, would be codices. The, um, Kof with the two lines and the yod is an abbreviation for kathub yod, written by hand. And that's in the abbreviation section. So in most, basically in most handwritten manuscripts, in most codices written by hand. And then he says, um, 
and in co the next two words are in copies of the printed text. And you can f those were also sometimes like let's say you want to look up that word right after the Cthuviode. It's not under the wow. Go ahead and find that word. Let's, just, let's, let's just go ahead and review. Go ahead and find that word in the abbreviation section after the Cthuviode. And tell me what letter you're looking under. Underneath what? Calf. Well, we're not talking about the Cthuviode, the word after Cthuviode. That begins with a wow. See, there's a wow, there's a baith, there's a noon, there's a wow, there's a samech, there's a chayth, aleph, wow, tau. See what word I'm talking about? Oh. So see if, see if you can find that word. Okay, I would look at noon then. Okay, good. Yeah, look under noon. Yeah, I just want to point out, you don't look under wow and bait. That's often like and in. Okay, it is copies, examples. Good. Yeah, you, well, you notice that's noon with the two lines in Aleph. And we don't have the word other here. Maybe that's where you got the other from. It just, so, but that word is no sechoth, which is the word copies. So, and there isn't followed by the word ach, um, acherein, na. So, but the first word is copies. So, and in copies, and the word after that, and this one was a hard one to find. That word um, is from dafas, which means to press. Um, and it, it had dafus means um, that's printed. So that, that note is in, in the printed text. You can find that dafus on page 62, where it gives you the printed editions of the Hebrew Bible. The first one is dafus aleph. Next one is the Fus Beith on page 62. See, it says Pentateuch, Prophets, all that stuff. Yeah, so th this note was, a, was kind of a doozy. But what it's saying is it's saying, first it says in most handwritten manuscripts, most codices written by hand, and in copies of the printed text, then it says Dasha. Desha, and then there's that word right after the desha. There's the baith, the zion, the two lines, and the kof. How would you find that? I'd look up in zion. Okay, and what is it? What does this mean? If you know already, you can tell me, but if you don't, then look it up. Little Zakef. Yeah, Zakef Katon. The accent Zakef Katon, little Zakef. So the note, the whole, this note, which is such a big bear, all it's saying is that in most handwritten manuscripts and copies of the print text, the Desha has a Zakef Katon accent. That's all it's telling you. Notice in the text what accent does the word have? Um, it is. I gotta find my accent sheet. You can also look on page 20 in this thing here, and they have all the accents there.
it would be one dot instead of two dots. So instead of Zakaf Katon, little Zakaf. Wait, what? what one was dot. Desha. Yeah. Okay. I was looking at the other word. It's actually two Ravia. accents below the Zakaf. Ravia. 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 Yeah, Ravia. 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 Good. So that whole note is just telling you that some manuscripts and print editions have Zakaf Katon instead of Ravia. So a lot of work to figure that out in that <laughs> one note there. But now you're learning how to do it. So um, I confess that like if you turn to like the book of Psalms later, there's tons and tons. Oh, he kind of, Ginsburg started to kind of go crazy a bit more on some of those textual notes later. I have to confess I don't always translate them when I'm reading the Bible. But you do want to learn how to do it. Okay, uh, the next one. The next one's actually, I think, easier than, than that one. That one was a real, that one was uh, low toe. Um, what's the next one say? Oh, maybe that's what I was looking at. Is, um, it says um, another book. Sepharim Acharim, other copies. Other copies. Sepharim is books, Acharim other. That's that abbreviation, Sepharim Acharim. Other copies, mm -hmm. uh, what, eight? And the difference there versus the text is that there is a wow on the eights. Mm. So he's telling you that other copies have a wow on the eights instead of just the eights with no wow. What does it say after that? Um, and, and thus... And I don't know, I got lost with these other ones. In, okay. Those ones are some. all actually on one, they're close to each other. And let me find the page where they all. Um, well, for, let me just, I'll, if you're trying to find them, that's a, and thus, buh, so that's an in. So the actual thing you're trying to find is the thing with the chayf, the chayf and the, um, Sheen. Is it under faith? Nope. No. Nope. Okay. Go to page sixty two. When he's referring to ancient translations, those are all at the bottom of 62, where he says ancient versions, etc. So there, you can see that first thing. It's the Chame Shamri, the Samaritan Pentateuch. You see at the bottom of 62? So the Samaritan, so he says, and thus, so the Samaritan Pentateuch has the word and. And now that you're looking down there, what would that next one be? The Tau line line yod. <clears throat> targum with Jonathan. Good, the Targum Yonathan, the Targum Yonathan. And then what's the one after that? Targum. Where, where is it? Yeah, so the Targum. Targum with somebody. Yeah. Well, in oh, the bottom oh, of 62 oh, there. Us. The LXX. So the Greek Old Testament, which is the Targum of the 70 oh, in Hebrew. So the Targum of the 70, which is the LXX. And then what's the last one there? Um, and the Targum of Syriac. Yeah, the Syriac. So he's telling you that the word and is in the Samaritan Pentateuch, the jo Targum Jonathan, the LXX, and the Syriac. Aren't um, Targums kind of paraphrases? Yes, Targums tend to be paraphrastic. There are translations that tend to be, definite, yeah, they do tend to be paraphrastic. When we, in English, when we speak of the Targum Jonathan, the Targum, etc., we're talking about Aramaic um, paraphrastic renditions of the, of the Hebrew. But in Hebrew, they actually call the LXX the Targum of the 70. And actually, sometimes the LXX is pretty paraphrastic too. So maybe it's not a bad term. Okay, so that was a kind of a, 
exciting note. We have actually uh, two more notes that actually deal with inspired text instead of these crazy notes at the bottom. But let's take a little break before we get into them because that was, we haven't taken a break for a while. We're good? Okay, super. Okay, so now um, Genesis 111, what are the two pairs of words that are from cognate roots? Zereh, Mezri, Zero. Mazria. Remember, that's a third of Pathak, so you oh. pronounce it before the I. I Mazria. I must have not put the Pathak in my handwriting. Oh, really? Went away? Yeah. Yeah, it's a third of. Yeah, it, was, it was very third of. I can't read my handwriting in English half the time. Oh, no. Um, and then. So, what, what hope is there in Hebrew then? <laughs> <laughs> no, it's not okay. cool. Um, Dasha and Tad. Tadshe, yeah, great. Those are the two ones. So, good, yeah. So you could say, let the earth cause to bring, let the earth green itself with greenery, you could say. Um, Desha is a cognate accusative of the same root with Tadshe. Um, so it's greening itself with greenery, and it's um, herb seeding seed, causing seed to seed. Desha is the young or tender green which shoots up after rain and covers meadows and down, if you look at other references. Um, it's also a generic name for all grasses and um, cryptogamous plants. What's that? You don't know what cryptogamous means? Where <laughs> Superman came from, right? What? <laughs> so where Superman came from, right? <laughs> oh, man. Let me uh, get you a definition in the, uh, in the dictionary for cryptogamous. <laughs> it's like the old, oh, I'm just going to give you the definition. Okay. To hold your horses. Okay. Cryptogamous. Botany, any of the cryptogamia, <laughs> a form of primary division of plants that have no true flowers or seeds and that reproduce by spores as the ferns, mosses, fungi, and algae. So that is the definition. I actually just got it from uh, Kyle and Delich. But, um, it's a good Hebrew text commentary, Kalan Belichar. Um, there were conservative Lutherans. Actually, a, a nice commentary in Genesis. What is it? He was a converted Jew. The oh, one guy was. I don't remember. He might, he might have been. But they, it's a Hebrew text. But they were German. It was written in German. Somebody translated it in English. And it's a good, it's a conservative Hebrew text-based commentary. Relatively conservative. It's, there's, it has problems, but it's relatively conservative. Uh, one actually that's pretty decent by a Jew actually is uh, by Umberto Casuto. Um, he wrote a two-volume commentary. He actually wrote a book also devastating the documentary apocalypse. So Umberto Casuto, he taught at the Hebrew University of Jerusalem. Again, not, there's not that it has no problems. Like, of course, on something like Genesis 1, where God is speaking to himself, you know, there's going to be no trinity there, of course. But he has some good things to say on Hebrew. Word biblical commentary is often also good for Hebrew stuff, but their liberalism, sometimes their scholarly liberal commentaries have useful things on Hebrew, but sometimes their commentaries are just zany because, you know, this was written by P who's changing it from whatever, and it's, this is, it's useless, but they have some Hebrew stuff that's not bad. Okay, um, good. So those are the two uh, words from cognate roots. Can you give me the parsing for Zar O? Next question. It's a noun, masculine, singular, with a prenominal suffix for, well, that's what I just said. <laughs> okay. Noun, yeah. masculine, singular. Yes, it's a third masculine, singular suffix. I think that's the word you actually translate, his seed. Um, yeah. Wait, it's, I mean, its seed. Um, and zero is it? Absolute or construct? Um, I don't know 
like you have it worked by like it, it, you can tell it's it's contra because of the suffix. Yeah. I, I have the word of in my translation on that page. Yeah, it, it, the, the form is actually identi identical whether it's absolute or construct, but because of the suffix, it's actually construct. Um, so it's seed which is in it, <coughs> is the idea. And now zerat, the word seed is a collective noun. Um, zerat is singular, but do all trees produce fruit that has only one seed inside? No. no the peach does, it's one big seed, but obviously there's trees that produce fruit with multiple seeds. Um, and that collective singular idea actually is something to keep in the back of your head for texts like Genesis 2.15, the seed of the woman, this idea of a collective um, singular, which Lord willing that we get there in the second semester. Um, now the, the phrase eight peri ose peri lamino, the tree of fruit making fruit to its kind, that doesn't mean that trees that do not bear fruit edible by humans are excluded. So for example, let's say there's trees that give us nice shade, um, but we don't eat the fruit, but maybe they still bear fruit. Um, you know, animals uh, eat fruit from trees that we don't necessarily eat from. So it's not only talking about, you know, olive trees and peach trees and stuff like that. This is broader than that. So, so in this verse, um, who is the source of fertility for the land and the fruit? God. God, yeah. It's not you know, some pagan deity. It's, it's the true God. And uh, if you're in an agrarian society where you r realize that you need the fruit to gr you need stuff to grow, you know, you're going to be grateful to God for giving you this stuff. And we, even though we're kind of more separated from it, because we just go to the store, and if there's a drought here, they can ship it from wherever. Um, it's still ultimately from God. So we should be just as thankful as Israel was for the fact that we can eat the stuff that God created here. We should be very thankful for it. Um, notice also in the verse it says, on the beginning, Yomer Elohim Tad Haaretz. So God is the one who, the earth is the agent through which God mediates his generative power. So it's not Mother Nature. It's not ancient Near Eastern fertility cult, it's God actually who makes the plants grow. Um, and he's the ultimate source, even though you know, God put natural laws in the world so that plants can reproduce and so on. But he's the one who does it. It's not you know, Mother Nature here. So. Now also note that the complex forms of plants like the fruit trees here are before the creation of any form of animal life, which doesn't fit with uh, modern evolutionary ideas, which have marine animals, um, invertebrates and vertebrates, millions of years before fruit trees. Um, many plants also require pollination by insects, but there weren't insects till the sixth day. So if these were millions of years long ages, that was a long time for them to survive um, until the plants came, until the insects came. Uh, notice also the creation is let me know after his kind. So there is not an infinite malleability among created groupings. Um, is min the same thing as the modern term species? No. No. At least not necessarily. Um, it can be a higher order thing than what we call a species. It would be more in line with the term family. Yeah, often, often with a family. Yeah. So there are limits beyond which you can't go. You can't have everything from the slime. The slime became you. But it doesn't just mean you know you, ha you, ha you name one species of finch with this kind of beak and one with this kind of beak that therefore you know, the Bible's shown false here. Um. <coughs> OK. Um, the, I'm going to read you a little note here. Um, you do have, in terms of um, the range of men, I'm going to read you something from uh, Walter Kaiser in Theological Word Book of the Old Testament. This is a useful little note on the word men. He said, some have argued that when God created a mean, he thereby fixed the species. This is a gratuitous assumption because a link between the word men with the biologist's descriptive term species cannot be substantiated, and because there are as many different definitions of species as there are biologists. In light of the distinctions made in Genesis 1, 
such as the distinction between herbs and grasses, which are, however, members of the same class, angiosperms, it is possible that in some cases the biblical term mean may indicate a broader group, such as an order. Elsewhere, in Leviticus 11.14, 15, 16, 9.22, 4 times, 29, mean appears consistently as equivalent to nothing, nothing broader than a genus. However, Leviticus 11.4, the falcon after its kind, 11.16, the hawk after its kind, refer to divisions within the order falcon formis, yet both have subdivisions called mean. Likewise, as Payne points out, the locust, ball locust, cricket, and grasshopper all belong to the order orthopetra, and the locust, ball locust, and grasshopper belong to the family acridiae, but again, each has subdivisions called mean. So God created the basic forms of life called mean, which can be classified, according to modern biologists and zoologists, as sometimes species, sometimes genus, sometimes family or order. This gives no support to the classical evolutionist view, which requires developments across kingdom, phyla, and classes. So sometimes it's what we today that with evolutionary assumptions call a high, you know, all the way up to like you know, order. Sometimes it's more narrow, what we call genus, but in there. Kaiser? Yeah, he probably is. So, but it's interesting, he actually says there's limits. You can't have kingdom phylum classes. I wonder if he's like a gap theory guy or something. No, he has, um, I'm trying to think what it's called. Walter Kaiser? He thinks, yeah, Walter Kaiser. Hmm. He thinks like the, f the days before the sun and the moon were created were not, were long periods of time. Oh. And then, okay. then you got 24 periods after the. Oh. Okay. The sun was created. Interesting. I guess that's a way to stick the days in. Yeah. Stick the long ages in. <coughs> no death, though, so it doesn't help you too much. Okay. Well, any other comments on verse 11? Maybe he thinks there was death. He does. He does. Okay. He does. All right. Humiliating to you. That's too bad. Very good, though. All the agony and pain. Mm -hmm. Okay, let's translate verse 12. <laughs> okay, verse 12. Um wetse ha arets the she a sev mazria 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 zera la mine who wa eats um, Osha Pari. Osa. Os Osa Pari. Asher. 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 Zero. Zero Bo. La Bo. Zero Bo. Bo. Zero Bo. Laminehu. Weyer. Elohim. Kitov. Right. Which is and caused the earth to bring forth grass, herb to produce seed um, toward their kind, and it was evening. And it was morning, day three. Whoa. <laughs> I think we missed a lot of the verse. There's a scribal error here somewhere. Okay. Second half of the verse went into the gap. Or the gap theory in verse 12. Here. There might be. <laughs> <laughs> oh, no. Home Hotel Utah or something. There appears to be a mighty gap. All right. Yes, I would say so. Well, let's uh, figure out what's going on here. In the beginning of the verse, Watotse Haaretz Desha Asev, Asev Mazria Zera. What is the subject of Totseya? Totseya. The subject would be the earth. Good, yeah, so the earth, 
caused to go forth or brought forth Desha. Okay. The way you translate it, it sounded like there was no subject to the verb. What's the parsing? What's the trilateral root? Well, I, gave, I think you gave this. It's Yatsa. Which, and what does Yatsa mean? Yatsa means um, bring forth. It does in the Hifiel. The cow, the basic, if you look it up on Yatsa, um, it's on page. 424 and 25. Yeah, well, 422 is where it starts, and it just says go or come out. So yatsa is go or come out, and the hifil, it's caused to go or come out, which is brought out. So the earth brought forth, caused to go out, desha, grass. And then you have asev, herbs, <coughs> um, grass, mazria which is the hifiel, it's like in the verse before. Um, grass, um, sowing, causing to sow seed, yielding seed, zera. So grass, causing to sow or yielding seed, laminehu, after its kind. And then the next part is where it disappeared, I think. Yeah. Can you, can you just, uh, can you do the next part without? Well, eight is and trees. Um, well, it's it's it is um, singular. Yeah. So and and tree. Uh huh. Ose is um, made making. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's the cow participle, masculine singular, absolute. So the tree making pari. Pari okay. fruit. So so the tree making fruit, yielding fruit. Asher is that or which. Which, uh, zero, vo, vo, zero, vo, zero, vo, um, which is a, the seed in it, his his seed in it, its seed in it, la minehu, it after its kind. Good. So the tree making fruit that its seed is in it, to its kind, according to its kind. Uh, I know I translated it towards their kind. Yeah, How where did that? the towards come from? I don't know where you got Just towards. Just two. Like yeah, la is two or four. And, uh, never towards. I mean, it's such a common preposition. I thought of it as like a directional, but it gave a broad scope of kind <laughs> instead of limited to species. Yeah, I mean, um, well, la, two or four is safe. Because it's such a common preposition, it can mean a lot of things like one, definition one in Kohler Barnard is locally two towards, purpose, aim, movement, temporally until, at, it, it keeps going. There is, let's see, there are 26 categories of meaning with Lamed. So, well, just like any, the more common preposition is, like if you looked up, Two in the English Oxford English Dictionary, you'd have a bazillion definitions too. So, but the seed yielding seed to its kind, with the idea of according to its kind, would I think be better than toward its kind here. I'm not saying there's no place in the whole Bible where it's never translated toward it. I don't I can't think of any, but there might be one somewhere. But um, the point is that it's according to its kind, to its kind. How about the last clause? Well, yer Elohim kitov. Um, well, yer is, um, and and he saw Elohim God, uh, ki that tov good. Good. And the way yer is we parsed it before. It's ra kalva consecutive to ems apostrophe to kasi ra. And God saw that it was good. Okay. What is the word in this verse that is the main pausal accent? That would be um, la mi minehu. Good. And what is the accent? It's an ethnic. Good. There's the ethnic. Good. And notice that if, as you translate it, um, it's reasonable to have 
a pause after that. So the earth brought forth grass and herb, uh, making seed uh, according to its kind, and the tree making fruit whose seed was in itself according to its kind. Pause. And God saw that it was good. There's a colon in the King James. I didn't make it to the second one. <laughs> yeah, you had a... Uh, I had the first one. <laughs> yeah, the first part kind of disappeared. So... Um, there's two kinds of seeds here. One, like grass that yields its seeds naturally, and the fruit tree whose seed is in it. So there seems to be these two kinds here. Um, all right, any other questions on verse 12? I don't think so. No, okay, well, let's go on to verse 13. Short verse. Uh, okay. Uh, where Yahi Erev, where Yahi Bokher Yom Shalishi. Mm -hmm. And it was evening and it was morning, day three. All right. Tov Ma'od. Pretty simple verse. Any questions on the parsing of the verse or the meaning of it? Unlike the first two days of creation, the third day, there's two acts of creation. So there's the vegetation on the land here. Um, and so this is the climax of the first grouping of three days. So for the first time, the earth is productive here. And the presence of the vegetation prepares the way for the life systems to follow by giving the diet for the animal and human life. And the arrangement of the days, it differentiates between those creatures that have movement. Um, the sun and moon appear to move in the sky, and I mean, they do move in the solar system and so on. And the things that appear to move are on days four through six, and those elements that do not move, such as the vegetation, were on days one through three. And vegetation was not considered alive in the way that animals or human uh, beings have life, which we'll see later, which is why there can be eating plants and there's still no death considered. Evening and morning were the third day. Um, those terms appear more than 100 times in the Old Testament. They do always have a literal meaning, termination of the daily period of light and darkness. Day modified by numeral, like third day, also occurs more than 100 times in the Pentateuch alone. It also always has a literal meaning. So you, if you're just reading this, you're going to include this is a literal day. So, Okay, anything else you want to say on verse 13? I think it was obvious in verse 5 where it only allowed two definitions, either a light period or the light and dark period for day. Yeah. I don't, I think yeah, if it looks you're like just sticking to the too. immediate text, you're, you don't have that wide range yet presented. Of meaning? Yeah. For day and night, you mean? Yeah. yeah for, it, well, for Yom in general, you have mm -hmm. in this chapter only the two definitions supplied so far. Yeah, if you were just reading Genesis 1, you would have included something other than a literal day. You'd have to ask Darwin to tell you the truth to find out. But there's something else. All right, let's do verse 14. Um. I don't think the Old Testament requires a geocentric thing where the sun is literally going around the earth. I do not think that's a consequence of biblical literal interpretation. Like, the verses are supposed to prove all like Joshua, you know, sun stands still. Well, we would still say the same thing today when we don't think that's... And, and the place says that it talks about the two valleys. Those valleys are very close to each other. So if the sun is literally standing still, then it's like in the moon over the one valley, the sun over the other valley, they're very... Cl it's like the, if the earth is... If they're literally going on the earth, they're very close to each other then. Like, they're not like on the other bottom of the world or something going around. They're like both here and going around together. So it, I, don't, I don't think it proves it. I think it's very possible that the Earth is at the center of the universe. That's at least one explanation that people are given for, for redshift, if the Earth is in a special position and the universe is expanding. But um, I don't think the Bible requires us to say that the sun is literally going around the Earth and the Earth is totally stationary. Okay, let's do verse 14. Where Yomer Elohim Yahi 
Maorot Birkia Hashamayim Lahave the deal, Lahave deal Bain Hayom Wu Bain Hela Helai La Helaila Wa ha hau Haiwu Haiwu La o Oso La Osos Wu Moadim U la Moadim U la Moadim U la U Yamim Where's the Lam? Don't let the Lam go away. Ula Yamim. Ula Yamim. Uh, Washanim. Okay. What does that mean? <coughs> and God said, let the let there be light source in the firmament of the heavens for for the dividing between the day and between the night and let them be for sign and to appoint times and for days and years i supplied the word source where for the ma'arot yeah yeah light, yeah, light source or light bearers, it is a different word than or, so there's, there's a basis for that. Okay. Yeah. That's like bracketed it. Did you get it from somewhere? Well, from it said or? from light, may, may or. So I thought, well, if it's light's <laughs> coming. <laughs> what did, what did it, it say? It, it said or. No, I, uh, it, source of light, right? Yeah. Yeah, Luke, BDB, light, light bearer, luminary. Let me see. Lamp of sun or moon. Maybe. Page 22 in BDB. I'm trying to find where in my notes I have the word. Oh, here it is. From, uh, or, prefix from, to, or, light. From light, the source of which light comes. Oh, from. no, it's not just the prefix name luminary. on the word or. It oh, is no. actually a noun, ma'or. Okay. Look on page 22 of BDB and you'll find it. I actually do have that cited here. Oh, good. Yes. Luminary light, light bearer. Yes, good. Illuminating lamp of sun and moon, page mm -hmm. 22. Good. Yeah. Yeah, so it's a light bearer. So these are giving us light here. And I, I think, did you translate it as singular or plural? Here, ma'oro. Uh, I do have it in plural here. Good, yeah, it's light lights. Sources. I couldn't, I, I thought you said singular in the translation, but yes, it is plural, lights. It's lights, and later in the verse, la'othoth is signs. Moadim is season, well, we're going to talk about what moadim are. But all those words there are plural. Days, years, signs, seasons. Those are all plural. And I couldn't, I think, I wasn't sure whether you translated think was plural. sign was the word I have in a singular form. Oh, yes, no, that is, that is plural, othoth. Oath is sign. Othoth is signs. So that is a plural word. La othoth for signs. For signs and for moedim, which is plural, and for days and for years. You see that? Yep. Okay. Um, I think I gave you. Le have deal, the parsing. It's a hifdeal and kind of concert from Bardal. What does Bardal mean? Bardal. Yeah. Lexical root for le have deal. I 
he translated it. I must have it somewhere. Yeah, must in my somewhere. notes. Unless it has separated itself from the rest of the translation. You never know. Happens when you're translating on third shift. Mm, yes. <laughs> yes. I, I don't know. I don't I don't actually know why I don't Somehow say Somehow I started it. writing my dream down. <laughs> I don't know. I'm lost in my own writing. Uh oh. But Dale, where are we in 14? Let have the so it's Yomer Elohim and God said Yehi. Um, Cal imperfect three ms Joseph, let there be Mooroth, light bearers Barakia in the firmament or expanse Hashemayim of the heavens. Le have deal. Vein Hayom vein Halayla. Okay. Now I see where we're at. I should be able to find it. Um, oh, okay. Here it is. Badeo is to divide or separate. Good, yeah. So to divide or separate um, would be fine. This one it actually doesn't have a cow form um, in the New, Test New Testament. In the Old Testament, it's not in the New Testament either. But badal would be to be divided or separate, and then it's in the hifiel. In hifiel, it means divide or separate. So and that's hifiel and nifal is all you got. So um, to divide, bain between the day and between the night. Wahayu. Um, What's the parsing for wahayu? It is. Um a while con consecutive of Haya imperfect three M plural. You say imperfect or perfect? Uh, I have imperfect on my thing, but it's supposed to be perfect, I think. Yeah, it's just the perfect. And that while on the front, is it does it have is it, wh wh what's the difference? Why, notice it's just wow with shawa, not wow path act plus doubling. Mm -hmm. okay. Now it does flip the sense of the perfect verb, but um, it's not the wow path act plus doubling form. And since the he, which it's continuing the idea of, is let there be, it's adjustive. Um, and the wow consecutive, or and the wow here is continuing that. So it's let there be lights, and you can say and they will be, or and let them be. There's that imperatival sense to it uh, for sign seasons, days and years. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, let's see. Do you have any other translation questions on there? I don't think so. Yeah. I gave you there the singular verb, yehi ma'oroth. Ma'oroth is, hey, I even told you ma'oroth. Oh, no, that's a different word. But yehi ma'oroth there. Um, let me go back to the actual text here. Yehi is 3ms, and ma'oroth is plural. Say, so, well, how can you have a singular verb with a plural subject there, but I gave you the, in, that Gesenius in his Hebrew grammar mentions that um, such an exception to the general rule requiring agreement in number occurs, quote, very frequently when the predicate precedes the subject, denoting animals or things, from Gesenius' Hebrew grammar. Okay, um, give me the parsing for Ula Mo, uh, Moedim, and tell me about what it means. whether you agree with the Targum Pseudo-Jonathan or not, and why there is an ooh instead of a wuh. Do that one first, because that's the easiest one. The, why is there ooh and Why is it ooh and not wuh? Because uh, it's ooh instead of wuh because of disjunctive accent. 
because of the disjunctive accent. Hmm. Okay. What is that accent underneath on the Lamoedine? It is a Munak. Munak. Okay. Is Munak disjunctive or conjunctive? Conjunctive. Yeah, so that would kind of not work too well. As an exclamation. What happened to Moadim, right? Huh? Moadim has the Zakaf Katon on it. Take a look. Let me wait. Oh yeah, you're right. Well, it, hmm. it has both under the mem. Where is the melody? Oh, I'm in chapter two. No wonder I can't find it. Oh. That would make it much harder if I'm in the wrong chapter. My physical copy here. That is actually not the reason, though. Uh, if you want the real reason, look at page 40 of Lambden. That's an interesting reason, but it was not, not the reason. Bump. Okay, what is bump? Uh, the U, if it starts with Beth, Mem, or Pe. Okay, so does this word start with Beth, Mem, or Pe? Well, it, yes. <laughs> <laughs> Beth, Mem, or Pe, or Lamed? U, La, Moedim? No, it doesn't. Did I look at the wrong one? Well, it doesn't seem like bump would be the reason if there's not those words. But it's good to remember bump. Notice none of the reasons on, on paragraph 46 have to do with accents, so it wouldn't be, the accents wouldn't make it into an ooh. And bump is good to remember, but we don't have a, we have a llama here, not a bath, a pay, or a main, so it's not a. Okay, before the word beginning with any consonant except for yod plus shawa, the form is u. Good. And there, this we do have. So it's yeah. lamed shawa. So that's why it's u le moadim. And that's also why it's u le yamim in the one right after that. While it's wu shanim at the end, because their shanim has a comets, but le yamim has a shawa underneath the lamed. Good. So that's the answer to that. It's 40, paragraph 40, or not paragraph, page 40. Of Lambden. What paragraph is it? 46. 46. Yeah, so that's the reason why it is a ooh. That's the easy part. What is the parsing now for ooh la moedim? It is. Uh, Noun, masculine, plural. Good. It is a masculine, plural noun. Is it absolute or construct? Absolute. Good. So masculine, plural, absolute noun. What's the lexical form? Uh, moed. Moed. Moed, yes. 
and then what is on the front of the word here? Uh, la prefix. Good. And the a la prefix. And a what else? U. Yeah, and a wow. So an and and a la. Okay. And what does the word mean? A moed. Appointed time. Appointed time or place time. or meeting. Times, wouldn't it? In a plural form. Yeah. I guess. Appointed time. Did you look it up in BDB? Um, I, let me see. Yes, I have page 417. It said uh, appointed time in general with prefix la at n or the appointed time, the references to sacred seasons as fixed by the moon's appearance. Mm. Good. So yeah, you're reading down where it says it is most probable in Genesis 114, that part, right? Probably. Yeah, take a look at page. No, go ahead and look at that page. <laughs> so there, if you see the word moed, notice at the top it says appointed time, place, or meeting. And one, appointed times. And down there it says it is most probable in Genesis 114, which it tells you is in the P document, which is very nice, where it um, gives you the word. The references to the sacred seasons as fixed by the moon's appearance, so like the new moon festivals. So you made the moon for sacred seasons, Psalm 10419. Though all the many lexicons and commentaries simply refer to the seasons of the year. So BDB, and then it says definition two appointed meeting, definition three appointed place. By the way, um, the fact that the worship festivals of Israel had to be appointed supports the regular principle of worship, that in worship, we only worship God specifically the way he's commanded us, because the word specifically is talking about appointed worship. So BDB thinks that the moon here was not appointed for general seasons of the year, the sun and the moon, but specifically for the sacred seasons of worship that Israel had. And that's what P would have thought. Um, the Targum Pseudo Jonathan, where, of course, nobody thought of J-E-D-P yet, says um, that, I gave you that somewhere. What, what page, do you, can you read what the Targum Pseudo Jonathan says? Oh, okay. um. And you can see here, uh, Targum is not the most literal thing. It's right after that huge list of all the verses with the word congregation. Then God said, let there be lights in the firmament of the heavens to divide between the daytime and the nighttime. And let them be for signs and for appointed times of festivals. That's and the Moedim there, of course. And by which to count the calculations of the days and for sanctifying the new moons and new years and intercalculation of months and intercalculation of years. Intercalation. Calations, okay. And an intercalation is the insertion of a leap day, week, or month into some calendar year to make the calendar fall the seasons. That's what that means. And the solstice of the sun, and the birth of the new moon, and the solar cycle. So you can see that the Targum is paraphrased. But here, he also thinks that the Moedim is speaking about the festivals of Israel versus just seasons in general. So that's what they think. Is that probably why BDB was like, oh, it's priestly? Well, they, they think Genesis 1 is in the P document. Um, for because it doesn't, it can't be in the J document because it doesn't have the name Jehovah in it, of course even though there's good reasons for that, but don't Isn't worry about it. Is it an Elohim document? Yeah, it could be an E. Yeah, they could put in the E document. But then, see, it also has the holy word group. See, it has Kadash later, so that would show you know, something else. I don't know. You can just, it's in the N document, the non-existent made-up <laughs> document. Okay, so um, are, is this ancient Jewish interpretation correct, where it says that the seasons here are specifically not talking about the seasons of the year, but specifically the seasons 
for Israel's festivals in light of the usage in the rest of the Pentateuch, which you can see there are many uses in the rest of the Pentateuch, and not many other ones in Genesis, but a few. What do you think? Well, it, it's usually translated as congregation, as referring to their time they would congregate. Okay. Well, it's like a tabernacle congregation, which was the appointed place of meeting. Mm -hmm. It was appointed meeting when they translated congregation to Hebrew there. Remember, it's appointed time, could be appointed place, appointed whatever. So, so what do you think? Is this is is, is the Moses's point here? Is Moshe's point, and it is in the Hebrew, it's Moshe. So is Moshe's point that God put the sun and the moon in the sky? so that Israel would know when their days of special worship were? Or did they put them in the sky so that um, we would have the seasons of the year? Well, in Genesis 1, since Israel didn't have their festivals at this point in time, I don't think that would be the proper way to perceive it, but though I could see an interweaving of the concepts, actually. Huh? Yeah. Okay. All right. Well, who's the audience? Who's who's he writing to? Who's this this? To Israel. Okay. So maybe he, um, maybe he gave them these festivals, and the Israelite would think, wow, even the sun and the moon and the skies are... Well, I'll, 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 this is what I think. Um, by the way, the Kohler Barmer lexicon also thinks that it's, with VDB, they both think that it's you know, the appointed festivals is what it's talking about. I think an Israelite reading the Pentateuch would think God created the heavenly bodies for the purpose of our Moedi, for the purpose of our festivals which would also confirm to the Israelites that the heavenly bodies were not objects of worship because you don't worship the sun in the sky. They're in there actually so that we know when we're supposed to worship Jehovah. Um, and they're not gods to be feared. They're not sources for astrological divination. They're actually pointing out the times when you worship the one true God um, by, created by divine fiat, by Jehovah, the God of Israel. Um, and creation itself was made by God for his glory. So it would be reasonable to think that the signs of the times for special worship would also be put in there for his glory. Um, and um, in terms of application, I think we should think that we should rejoice when the cycle of the week comes around to the Lord's Day uh, and sanctify every day to the Lord in light of the fact that God has put these heavenly uh, markers of time up there. Um, Matthew Henry has some good things. He said, The duty and wisdom of daily worshiping the God who made all things and made them to be that to us which they are. The revolutions of day and night oblige us to offer the solemn sacrifice of prayer and praise every morning and evening. So I think an Israelite would think about his festivals and think about how God put these things there not to be worshipped, but as signs of when we're supposed to especially worship the Lord. But I don't think that that's the sole reason for him putting them in there. Uh, so they are for times and seasons for every nation on earth and every dispensation, not for Israel alone. Because this is before Israel and all those things. So um, the use of the more general sense season without a specific reference to Israel's worship is seen in the other references of the Pentateuch itself. Like if you look at the other three references that follow in Genesis in that big, huge list, it's general seasons of the year. It's not just like Israel's appointed festival. Um, in the other texts, Genesis 17, 21, 18, 14, 21, 2. Let me go back and get those. Um, Sarah will be, bear a son at the set time in the next year. Genesis 18, 14. At the time appointed, I will return. Sarah shall have a son at the set time which God has spoken. So those aren't specific Israelite worship festivals. It's just times of the year. So... I think that translating a season versus something like appointed festival is superior because it's not limited to Israel's festivals here. Um, I think the interpretation of the verse is that there are these marking the seasons of the year. 
and therefore, as a translation, the more general seasons is better the inter than the interpretive reading of the Targum, where it's a, you know, Israel's festivals. Um, but I also think that there is a definite allusion to the Israelite appointed festivals, um, and the Israelite would think about them. And um, that is part of the reason God actually made the times of the year, is so that we get to the times when we specially set apart time to worship him. And I think that we should think about time that way. I think the Israelite reading this would have thought about time that way. And I think that's good for us to think about time that way. So, um, so it's a blessing that, that, to think about that God has put creation together in such a way so that we have special times to worship the Lord. Amen. Um, the question then also comes up, in what sense are the stars signs? Um, and I think it would be the natural view would be that they're signs because just like the constellations are different places when different seasons of the year and so on, they would fit in with that thing. So the signs and seasons are not like as much. This, they are signs of God's glory, like Psalm 19. They, they can sometimes talk about coming judgments, like the stars are going to fall from heaven. There's going to be signs that way. They can be signs for when you're supposed to plow and sow. They can be signs showing you which way is north and south and east and west even signs of good or bad weather, um, whether you can see them, I guess, if it's cloudy, um, things like that. Well, Matthew 16, 2 and 3, you know, the signs, you can see it's red, it's going to be good weather. But the main point, I think, is the designating the passing of time, because it's with seasons. So the signs and the seasons, they both are telling you they're time markers, just like days and years are time markers. So the main point is they're time markers. And notice that the days and the years of the verse are conjoined without a lamed, so it's four signs and four seasons and four days and years. So time markers, not four days and four years because of the Lamed not being there. So I think we should think about time in terms of God's worship, and the Israelite would have thought about those things and also about you know, what I just mentioned, how you know, we aren't supposed to worship the sun and stuff. But the general translation seasons is superior. Now, in this verse, he did create the sun and the moon and the stars, ex nihilo, here on day four. Um, it's possible that a manifestation of divine glory from some fixed point was radiating, was where we got the light before this time. But now the light function is assumed by the sun, moon, and stars. And one thing that Israel would learn from that is that the God, not the bodies themselves, would be the source of light, heat, and life. So since there was light and heat and life before the sun, moon, and stars, the bodies themselves aren't the ultimate source of that. Now, obviously, they're very, we're very thankful that God put them there. And our life now is dependent upon you know, God putting the sun there. But Israel would learn, OK, we're dependent on God, not the sun, to provide for us. So therefore, we don't worship the sun. We worship God. Um, the sun is God's servant that he put in the sky to uh, um, point out the time when we're supposed to gather together to worship Jehovah. Something else you can see that God made the sun here after the vegetation, that certainly doesn't fit um, evolution very well. Um, and we mentioned already with mo'oroth mo as light bearers, is a different word for light than in Genesis 1, 3, or light. These are light bearers. They're the luminaries giving off light. Um, the fact that the moon is called a luminary, just like the sun, doesn't mean they're both you know, ultimate sources of light. Obviously, the sun's generating light, the moon's reflecting it. But they both give light as far as Earth is concerned. Here on Earth, we're getting light from them. So they're luminaries to us. I don't think here or anywhere else in Scripture does the Bible say the constellations preach the gospel in the sense of special revelation. See, like the gospel and the star, like the sun, this is like the symbol of whatever. I think that's really reading into it. Um, general revelation is inferior to special revelation. I think the gospel and the stars thing is just more speculative than anything that we can really get from the Bible. So um, We can also learn God is the God of order, not of confusion. As he's light, he's the father and former of lights. I'll read you a nice application. This is a neat application here. Uh, this is from Matthew Henry, about this, the God making the light. They do also give light upon the earth that we may walk, John 11, 9, and work, John 9, 4, according as the duty of every day requires. The lights of heaven do not shine for themselves, nor for the world of spirits above who need them not. But they shine for us, for our pleasure and advantage. <clears throat> Lord, what is man that he should be thus regarded? Psalm 18, 4. How ungrateful and inexcusable are we if, when God has set up these lights for us to work by, 
we sleep or play or trifle away the time of business and neglect the great work we were sent into the world about. The lights of heaven are made to serve us, and they do it faithfully and shine in their season without fail. But we are set as lights in this world to serve God. And do we in like manner answer the end of our creation? No, we do not. Our lights do not shine before God as his lights shine before us. Matthew 5.14 We burn our master's candles, but do not mind our master's work. Now I'm going to read you an interesting thought that Zwingli said, though this is more speculative than dogmatic. This is something Zwingli said. Here arises a question that tormented the old theologians. Why would the sun and moon have been created only now on the fourth day, when light was made on the first day, and thus day and night, which depend upon the sun and moon? By his nature, God is light and gives light to all things, for he dwells in inaccessible light. Therefore, by his own light, he made daylight for the first three days, and it shone without any other means. And no one who is pious doubts that the mystery of the Trinity lurks here. We thereby learn that he alone is the light that illumines all things, the one from whom all things have light, and we are warned lest we worship the sun and moon for their own sake as the pagans do. Nor should we suppose that light derives from them rather than from God himself alone, the source of light, but recognize instead that the sun and moon are the most instruments of his light. So the, the Trinity is there. I mean, I don't want to say it's not, but... That's definitely speculative. Um, so, and now, of course, in this day, we have the beginning of the second phase. Um, the first stage, we had the three sections of the inanimate world and the vegetation, all the things that can't move by themselves. Now we're having, in parallel order, the mobile beings, the luminaries, um, the move, moving bodies which the light formed in the first days crystallized, and on the fifth and sixth days, the creatures that correspond to the world for the first, the second, and third days. Okay, anything else you want to say on verse 14? No, not really. No, okay. Let's do verse 15. Wahayu, wu, wahayu, limoros, birkia, hashamayim, lahair, El Haaretz Wehayahi Kim. Okay. Which is, <coughs> and let it be for lights in the firmament of the heavens to give light upon the earth, and it was so. Okay, that first there, the Wehayu, what's the parsing for that? Uh, so while, oh wait, here I am. While consecutive, uh, uh, ya is, uh, perfect three, three, um, plural. And of course, in that perfect, there isn't a separate masculine feminine, so the third common plural. Halal perfect third common plural. The wow does flip it because it's on the ver verb, but it's not a wow consecutive form, of course, because it's just wow with a shua, as always on the perfect. And since it's continuing the sequence that began in the previous verse with um, let there be, the yehi, um, you could very reasonably say let them be for lights, lama oro for luminaries in the firmament of the heavens. Um, L'ha'ir, what is the lexical, I give you the parts, if you don't the construct, but what is the um, root and what does the root mean? The root is or for light, but it's a prefix with la and ha particle. Yeah, it's, well, it seems that the form is definitive concert that it's like to, to give light. Yeah, the idea there. And then, um, or is in um, basic, it says on BDE, be, be or become light. And since it's hifiel, it's the give light of sun, moon, and stars, lexicon calls it. So. 
Okay, al haaretz by the heat pain. You have any other translation questions on verse 15? <clears throat> I don't think so. Okay. Can you translate the Masoretic note on verse 15? Uh, that is Jericho provided with Methag. Yeah. Um, yeah. So Lohair has an in, you know, you could supply in codex, but just says Jericho. Yeah, it's, the idea is in, in Jericho, in Codex Jericho, written with Methag. So here again, we can see that the ancient Codex Jericho um, had vowel points. So it would seem unusual if the Masoretes invented the vowel points that they also um, put these would put in notes like this too. Um, somewhat unusual if that were the case. Um, and notice in the actual text, though, the actual preserved text, uh, it doesn't. In the, not the footnote. There is no method there. So. Okay, super. Um, there is an ascending order in the heavenly bodies, verses 14 to 15. The primary object for the light, which is mentioned last, um, explained this way. You go from the astrological and the chronological utility to heavenly bodies to the universal utility from the necessity of light for, the, for growth and continuance of everything earthly. So there is that progress there. Do you have anything else you want to say in verse 15? Nope. You want to take a break? OK. We kind of started a little bit late. OK, we'll take a break. And then we'll... OK, well, for this final portion of the class, we had uh, Toad Maod come up here. So he will be silently correcting the grammar. And he won't say much. He he's, tends to be silent. But when it's good, so we've been doing pretty well in the translation, so we brought in Toad Maod. So that's good. <laughs> All right. Um, let's. Uh, you were in verse 16 here. I think we just started verse 16, right? Um, we just finished 16. Okay, yeah. So go ahead and translate verse 16. Yeah, read Wait, in Hebrew. Read, read in Hebrew first, yeah. Um, yeah, Toad Maod, actually, he converted to Judaism back um, in the days of the Exodus his ancestors, um, so during the plagues. Um, but they actually thought that the plague of the frogs was, was kind of sad and all the frogs died. But Yeah, I mean, he saw that this was, I mean, he thought the being in the houses was great. It was just the, the, the what happened after that when they died, it was kind of sad. But, but their family started to think about death through that. And, you know, they realized they needed the true God, so. That was many generations of frogs ago, of course. Anyway, OK, verse 16. They entered the house of mourning. <laughs> I guess they did. <laughs> OK. <laughs> Wait. <laughs> OK. Wait, yes. Wait, yes, Elohim, F. Shane. Ham Oroth Heg Hegatholim 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 F Hema Or Maor Hagathol La Lamem Lamem Shelleth Heom Wa F Hama Or Hakaton La Mem Shelleth Hele Helela Wa Eth Hekokavim And God made two of the lights as the great 
the great light source for the rule of the day and the smaller light source for the rule of the night and the <coughs> stars. All right. Hagadolim. Who parsed that word? Vayas Elohim et Shnei Hamaroth Hagadolim. Hagadolim. It is from Gadol. Gadol, okay. Gadol. The lexical form, Gadol. Which would be an adjective in plural. Okay. Masculine or feminine? or? It is masculine. Singular or plural? Plural. Okay. It's a masculine plural adjective. It's an absolute form. Gadolim. Uh, if it's, what's it modifying? It is modifying the lights. Ma'oroth. Ma'oroth. So uh, Elohim, Ya'as, and God made, F, direct object marker, Shnei Ha'ma'oroth Hagadolim. And of course, there's even the Aphmat there. So, and God made two great lights. I think the great kind of, there's a Gadol later in the verse, but I, it wasn't clear in your translation if the Gadolim kind of found its way later in the passage somehow. You know, I put it at the end of the clause here. Oh, really? Whoa. Yeah. The yeah. Gadolim definitely is not going to just find its way down at the end of the clause. <laughs> so that would not be approved by, by toad mode. <laughs> so... Yeah, so it's, it's just, and God made two great lights is the first part, okay? And then um, the F is the direct object marker kind of continuing from Yas. So God made F, two great lights, and then you have the description of the first light, which is Hama or Hagadol, the great light. And it can be greater, too. So you can say greater, it's fine. So the, the great light, la mem sheleth, which is, what is mem sheleth? Mem sheleth is uh, now a construct, noun, and uh, masculine. I mean, it, maybe it's masculine by the form, but if you look in the lexicon, it's going to tell you it's feminine. And if you also look at the left at the end, the tau, that kind of gives you a hint, okay. too. So it's a feminine singular noun, and it's in a construct form. Um, so to rule, it's a construct relation to day. So it's you know, for rule of the day, maybe you could say. Um, so the greater light for rule of the day, and the ma'or hakaton, the, the small light, the lesser light, for rule of the night. Lamem sheleth halayla. And as an addendum, wa'eth hakoheb havim, and the stars. Do you have questions about the translation of that verse? Nope. You can see how the ya'as goes through the whole thing, right? Mm -hmm. Okay. Okay. Tell me, please, um, the actions of the verse. I gave you this little note here. To note that in Genesis 1.16, hako havim, wa'eth hako havim, is not preceded by afnak, but is joined on by the accents in the part of the clause describing the lesser light, because the stars were appointed with the moon to light up the night. So the moon and the stars were both lighting up the night, and that um, the actions are conjoined that way to indicate that. So there's an exegetical point that you can see from the accents uh, from William Weeks's two treatises on the accentuation of the Old Testament, page 37, volume 2. All right, so let's uh, go ahead and just read each word and tell me the accent and say whether it's conjunctive, disjunctive, okay. and positive, post-positive, and so on. 
yeah, S, yeah, S, why yeah, S is, um, Ligerme, is that how you pronounce it? Ligerme is one, it's actually not that, but, um, the reason why there is, okay, Ligerme is, um, oh, it's actually a, a Munach. Good. How do you know it's Munak and not Ligarme? Because Ligarme has that line at the end of it. Good. There's no line afterwards. So it has to be the conjunctive accent Munak versus the disjunctive accent Ligarme. And you kind of see how a line is more is disjunctive, right? Mm -hmm. And so Munak, is it impositive, postpositive, prepositive? It would be a conjunctive and positive. Good. So Munak, conjunctive, and positive. Great. Tov Mo'ot. And then, uh, wait, what are we, 16? Yes. Elohim is uh, Zakhaif Katon, which is disjunctive and positive. Oh, I'll just throw this in. You know, there are, I'm asking more accent questions than really, you know, maybe uh, if it was just, if we're just executing the passage in just like a Hebrew syntax class, I wouldn't ask as many accent questions. But we're just learning the accents here. That's why, you know, I'm asking more. Anyway, okay, keep going. Eth Shane is um, Merka, which is conjunctive post positive. Uh, are you sure it's post positive? Um, it's on the Ultima, the last syllable here, but is Merka a uh, post positive accent? You can have an impositive accent, and if the word is accented on the final syllable, its accent is pretty near the back. Okay. So yeah, so it's just an, it's, America is actually just impositive. And if you look too, we notice that there, the yod, it's in between the tere and the yod too. So. Is it really? Yeah. This is verse 16. I guess. I think that's me. Well, yeah, it's pretty far over. Yeah, it, it's just Merica, and that, the, the accent is actually a uh, impositive accent. Okay. That's just it, that's just where the final syllable is. Yeah, that one's a little hard to tell. It, but you you could are you could say it looks post positive, but Merica is impositive. So. And then, uh, hey, Maoroth is uh, tifka, which is disjunctive and positive. Good. At first I was thinking you were saying there's an accent called ma'oroth. Like, what, what are you talking about? But yeah, <laughs> okay, yeah, tifka with on the ma'oroth, good. Uh, hegadolim is the afmak, which is a disjunctive and positive. Good. Um, eth ha ma'or is then, uh, yeah, yeah, thief, yeah, thief, which is disjunctive and positive. There is one other accent that looks like yeah, thief. Tell me the name of the other one and tell me why you said this one was a yeah, thief and not that other one. Um, the other one must be uh, Mahupak. Yeah, Mahupak. Mahupak. Okay. And because um, Yathiv is. Prepositive. <laughs> ah, <laughs> yes, Yathiv is a prepositive accent. Does this accent look prepositive to you? No, not today. It does not look <laughs> prepositive at all. So that would be a Mahupak, a conjunctive and positive Mahupak versus a. And you know it's not a Yathiv because it's not prepositive. Among other reasons. All right. Then is Hegadol. Hegadol, uh, which would be. Where am I? Okay. Pash, pashta, disjunctive, post positive. Good. One way to remember pash, Pashta is post positive. It sounds po like you can say post positive Pashta. Oh, it's an easy way to remember it. Yeah, so in there you can clear, it does look very post-positive. Okay, keep going. 
La Memsheleth is Legermeia, <coughs> which is disjunctive and positive. Hey. Um, there is, it is not Legermeia. Oh, oh, I got that again. No lie. Munak. Munak, good. Conjunctive and positive Munak. Conjunctive and positive. Okay. Maybe I should stop reading my notes. <laughs> Well, I could see, I mean, you, 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 you just found that one and it looks the same, so you just made the same mistake twice. You know, that, that happens. Hayom is uh, Zakaf Katon, disjunctive and positive. Wa'eth Hemma'or is not a Yafiv. No. But uh, mahupak. Good. Which would be conjunctive. Wait, where am I? In positive? Yes, conjunctive and positive. What word was that? Um, oh, okay. Eth, Hema, okay. Hayom wa eth hama or then hakaton is hakaton is pashta. Which is disjunctive post positive. Good. La mem shaleth is a uh, munach conjunctive impositive. Helela would be. It's a cave katon, a disjunctive and positive. What eighth? No, you're right. I accidentally, in my notes, it said the exact cave katon was conjunctive, but it's not. So I don't know why I said that. I must have just accidentally said that. Okay, good. Keep going. I think I, what I, I think I might have just cut and pasted from before. And anyway, disjunctive and positive is correct. Good. What eighth is. Um, Tifka, disjunctive and positive, and hekokavim would be siluk, siluk, and the sof pasuk. Good. Siluk and the sof and siluk is what? Oh, siluk is um, disjunctive and positive. Good. Tov ma'od. Okay, which words have rafa? Uh, I don't know what that is. You don't know what rafa is? Oh dear, oh dear, oh dear. Oh, it's in your handout from... Um, one. Ya'un Mura Oka. So, and maybe another one too, but Ya'un Mura Oka has this section on Rafa. And I will get my edition of him up here. Yes, good. Oh, yeah. So read what that says about Rafa. <coughs> Rafa is a horizontal stroke over the consonant letter. It draws attention to the fact that the consonant is not marked by a point, namely of Dagesh, Forte, or Laney, or of me, me, feg, Mefik, Mefik. According to the circumstances, it has three values. One, it notes the absence of Degesh Forte, indicating specifically that the content consonant is not doubled. Uh, manuscripts contain such forms as Erim, 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 blind people, in order to avoid the pronunciation Erim. 
It notes the absence of Dagesh Laney, indicating specifically that the Bega, Begad Kafat is fricative. Mel K. In other words, it's not uh, without the Dagesh Laney inside. That's what fricative means? Fricative. Like, uh, fricative. Yeah, that's what it's like. It, the, like it's, in other words, it's like a sound instead of a b or a k instead of k. Okay. And similarly, the final hey is not pronounced la. Not la. La. That's the, we would pronounce those kind of pretty similar there. But okay, so in other words, absence of dogish forte to show it's not doubled. Um, absence of dogish lene. So in other words, it's over a gabad kafat when it doesn't have dogesh inside. So in this verse, which words have a rafa? A lot of them. Yeah, there's one word that actually has two rafas. Yeah, probably every word, doesn't it? Mm, not every word. Okay, let's see. F. Good. F has a rafa, yeah. And then hemeoroth. Good. Then hegadolim. Good. And then F again. Mm -hmm. uh, hegadol. Lemem shela. Hey, is that line between F and Hama or is that a Rafa? Or is that something else? Wait, what? Where? On there is there is a Rafa over the Tau and F, but is that line after the F and before the Hama or between the two words? Is that a Rafa? I don't see a line. Okay, so Wayas Elohim F Shine Hama Aroth Hagodolim. F hama or oh, no, that's a methig. That's not the right word. The methig is the underneath one. Okay, then that is the makaf. Makaf. Good. Yeah. Makaf. Keep going. Okay, Keep going. I see what you're saying. Um, all right, where was I? Le 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 mem shelath has one. Where? Over the tau. Oh, you know what? Woo! Oh, that wasn't good. Let me see. I think you're right, but I didn't. I, I took all the words and I put them in bold and italics, and I didn't do that one. Let me just check here. Yeah, it sure does. Oh, I missed that one. And then again, wa'eth. And then, lamem shaleth. And then, halela. And then, wa'eth. And then, kokavim. Kochavim is two. Yep. Good. It is one advantage that you have that some other Hebrew classes do not have. You actually are able to look at the text at here at the end of first semester even, and you can actually identify everything that you see. Some other classes you, you can't. You don't even know what these things are that are in the passage. Okay. Um, good. That was a kind of a doozy of a question, but we I think we're done with it. Um, pars la mem shelleth and ha ma'oroth. I think we already did mem shelleth, didn't we? I thought so. We might have, but it's a, it's a question down here. I just asked it, and I didn't actually recall the question, but. Okay, here it is. Um, noun, feminine, singular construct, and a noun, feminine, plural, absolute. Oh, yeah, la mem shalah is a feminine construct from mem shalah, mem shala, meaning rule or dominion. Um, and VDB says it's used of rule of heavenly bodies. Ham oroth, did you um, give me that one already? Noun, feminine, plural, or absolute. Good. Now, it does look feminine because it has the tau. But if you look in BDB, lexicon will tell you that it's actually masculine. And here you can actually tell. Notice that it's modified by hagadolim with an im. And the adjectives always don't confuse you. The adjectives will always tell the truth about whether it's masculine or feminine. So since it's modified by gadolim, you know that ma'oroth is masculine, even apart from just looking it up in BDB. Nouns, the endings on the nouns usually tell the truth about this. But there are some exceptions.
like this one. Uh, but the adjectives will always have the em if it's masculine or the oath if it's feminine. So, does that make sense? Mm -hmm. Okay, super. Okay, so the sun and the moon here, but not the stars, give a ta guide for the times of Israel's festivals. So after every seventh day night cycle comes the Sabbath, the new moon festival, each new moon, sun and moon determine the length of the year. That's likely a reason why the creation of the stars is just kind of tacked on at the end, because they weren't nearly as important for Israel's worship. Um, which, one thing, it shows how highly God views worship, and we should have the high view that, that he does. Um, the sun is a greater light than the moon, not because it provides more light to the earth, as much as, um, uh, or at the least, uh, obviously the moon is just reflective here. Um, But the sun is objectively, obviously the sun is also larger. Um, but, okay, we're gonna, I just flipped it around. The sun is obviously objectively larger, much larger than the moon in space. But the main point here is that the sun is a greater light because it gives more light to the earth. That's actually the main point versus it's objectively a much bigger ball of gas. The point here is, you know, obviously that's true, but it gives more light to the earth. And the stars, as I mentioned already, rule like with the, the moon over the night. Like Psalm 136, 8 and 9 says, The sun to rule by day, for his mercy endureth forever. The moon and stars to rule by night, for his mercy endureth ever. So the stars are God's subordinate deputy to the moon. So, um, these lights aren't given specific names. It doesn't say sun and moon here. It just says the greater light, lesser light. Um, as a rule, the names were given by God only to the greater sections into which the universe was divided, not to individual bodies of the plants or animals as a rule. So that's probably the primary reason the names are not specified in the account, that um, generally God gave the greater sections the names. Though certainly not given a specific name should have showed the vanity of sun and moon worship. So he doesn't even give it a name here. You know, lesser light, greater light. So, um, and there are names for divinities in um, ancient Near East for sun and moon, and um, certainly, you know, you wouldn't want to say that, you know, use the name for the, some, there's something that sounds like the name for this god that was worshipped and say this god is ruling the day. Oh, okay. You know, so, um, and also notice the sun and rule moon the day and the night. They don't rule men or determine the destinies of man like astrology says or something like that. Uh, man rules the earth, and God, not the sun, moon, and stars, rule him. They just, you know, rule the day and the night, giving sun and light. Okay, anything else you want to say in verse 16? I think we're out of time for now. So uh, um, we'll have to, Lord willing, finish that the rest of the next time. We'll take the frog down, too. Toad mode is done for today as well. So let's 26. And Lord willing, next class, we'll finish Genesis 1. And the final exam is coming. Very exciting. Almost done with a whole semester here. Okay, I will read verse 24, and you can read verse 25, and then I'll read verse 26 on page 233. Yevarekecha Yehovah wa Yishmarecha. Pa'er Yehovah Pa'naiv Elecha. We who neka, we who neka. Yesa yahawa panayaleka, we are same lacha shalom. Amen.